Good evening. Thank you for inviting uh, me and being with uh, us. Uh, I don't have a map to share with you, but I can tell you, Arvind, that uh, uh, as Albanians, we're proud that we're smaller than Portugal, which is very, very small compared to India. <laughs> so, so uh, again, we're uh, a couple of words about Albania. Uh, we are a country in Western Balkan. Uh, we have been uh, in famously and not proudly North Korea of Europe for a long time until 1990. Uh, we made it after 1990 with quite a lot of sacrifice. Uh, in 97, we had another calamity as it was in store for us. Uh, it's the infamous pyramid schemes, the Ponzi schemes. We actually uh, developed, I mean, the society, the lack of governance, bad management, political, uh, let's say, backing of a very bad event, took us through a social turmoil. Even Ponzi himself would have been jealous of the ingenuity of our Ponzi schemes. And, uh, of course, we learned from that. Though the scars accompanied us for at least 10 to 15 years. Uh, we took office, and when I say we, the coalition of the Socialist Party, together with a smaller left-wing party, we took office in 2013. And to me, but to many Albanians, the uh, situation was in a crisis almost equal to 97 from the financial economic point of view, but of course with, without the uh, Ponzi scheme, because the Ponzi scheme itself was being the public finances. And for many people that actually worked with Albania or know Albania, they uh, exactly can refer to the arrears unpaid, to the debt going up, to uncounted debt, definitely, and uh, also declining revenues. And the growth was statistically 0 0.8 uh, positive. In the meantime, in the background, and uh, of course many people have heard quite a lot about that, we had the Greece uh, financial crisis, and by the way, Greece is, that time, used to be the first investor in our country and the second trading partner. So you can imagine what kind of issues we were facing while 700,000 Albanians were working in Greece and many of them were coming, uh, were coming back. I would actually bring a slide just for you to see uh, some data and some, some info. Uh, we decided right away, the Prime Minister and the team, and I was uh, part of his team since 2013, we decided that there was no other way. It's not that if I come to you now and I would say we will all were in love with reforms, I would not lie, but I would not be very true. I mean, the reform was, became a necessity because there was no other way. There was a rock in front of us and an abyss behind us. So it was not one reform. As Arvin uh, was referring to the VAT reform, which is great, by the way, and I congratulate you. We have done that 20 years ago, but then we have not done the pension reform until 2013. We have not done the... Uh, overall tax administration reform, we did not do the administrative reform, the justice reform, the electric uh, energy sector reform. So practically, we took office at a, at a moment of uh, energy fiscal crisis and the energy crisis was hitting the budget but was also taking down all the economy. So practically, uh, we jumped on all these reforms and I'm not exaggerating now that after six years that I actually, uh, I'm not anymore the Minister of Finance, but I'm the Chairman of the uh, Parliamentary Economic and Finance Committee. When I look back, even counting the reforms, it's really not, let's say, simple. Imagine to kind of go through them and uh, uh, try to put the country into the right, right direction. I would say that this is a good moment when we decided to invite the IMF 
And by the way, this is a time when Ricardo and his team from CID joined us in our travel towards the, uh, I would say, towards the reforms. By the way, I am one of the people that I love mosquitoes. <laughs> and by the way, I worked for some years for one of the mosquitoes. <laughs> but I proudly can say, and Ricardo probably can confirm, that I slam one of the <laughs> mosquitoes. Uh, why do I say that? Practically, the IMF, as the IMF comes, uh, came to, the, to Albania with an austerity package. Then everybody knows what an austerity package can do. The austerity package in many countries brings, brings further austerity needs. And this, is, this was a dilemma between us, uh, taking the debt down, how fast can this consolidation, uh, would this consolidation hurt the growth? And then we managed to turn the package into a growth package. Today, we are growing at 4%. We're not 7% as China is, but for a small country like Albania, it's not little. It needs to be higher, definitely, but it's not, it's not little. And I can actually bring to you two uh, real examples from the IMF negotiations uh, that, that many uh, from the CID can confirm because they were, as I said, part of our negotiating team. We're negotiating how fast we're going to take the debt down. Imagine now in a uh, fiscal, con fiscal consolidation panorama in a country that is actually uh, everybody is against taking the debt down. Everybody, beside the prime minister and one or two of us in the government. And then everybody saying, why do you fight to take the debt down? On the other side, you have the fantastic mosquito that is talking to the minister of finance is saying, what are you talking about? Why do you want to take the debt down slower by two to three years? Why don't you take it down earlier? And then on the other side, you have the rest of Albania that's saying, why do we take the debt down? We need to invest. So practically, you have to kind of uh, make a balance there. And at one moment of time, and I'm sure that Ricardo remembers this very well, we're discussing uh, about a salary and pension increase. This is after the sacrifice that we're telling Albanian people, listen, we are going to do these reforms. These are very painful. They were very painful. 2015 was a very difficult year. Very difficult year because all the economy went through correction because of the uh, reforms and because of the tax changes and because of, tech, of, of uh, tax burden changes also. But 2016 started to actually pay back. And in 2017, we decided to uh, have a wage increase and pension increase. It was a $100 million package. It was more to show to the people that reforms matter. Without reforms, we cannot make it. But reforms pay back. And reforms were paying back in lowering unemployment, increasing slowly the real uh, wage, but on the other side, also wage increases in the public sector. And here is where the mosquito comes in its own DNA form. We're discussing about the package for $100 million, and then at one point of time, it was 12 midnight, and we're concluding the uh, negotiation where the IMF would not agree on a difference of $3 million. $3 million out of $100 million. So we, dis we started debating for long. In my strategy of negotiating with the IMF, which is not a strategy, it came naturally. Uh, I was not, I am not, and I will not be that smart to have a fantastic strategy of negotiation with the IMF, but I could stay at the table for 20 hours. This was, this was something that really, and repeating the same question and the same answer and the same word until who would be the first to surrender? So at one point I was saying, 
100, they were saying 97. It is ridiculous, but it is true. I can tell you, I'm not actually making it up. My chief of cabinet is right here, and Ricardo is right here, and many people, Ermal is here also, you know? And at one point of time, I said, enough is enough. I don't need you. Please, tomorrow, leave the country. <coughs> and there was, a, there, there was a chief of mission, a great lady, very smart, very professional, very caring. She said, in a very, very quiet, normal time, she said, okay, she pecked. I said, I'll come in January. And I said, no, 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 you're not coming ever. If you're coming as tourist in January, you're welcome. As IMF, out. They went back after two hours. They agreed so for the three million. So the mosquito is fantastic sometimes. But as Len said, you have to hit the mosquitoes sometimes. But be sure that the heat is in the right place and with the right power. Otherwise, they come back and they, come, and they came back as in Greece that I will not comment because maybe I'll be there, but probably, probably could, have done, could have been done uh, different. But I could bring you an example of the, of the administrative reform and, and I'll not take more of your time because I, I would prefer if there is any question. Uh, think about 371 administrative units in the country, like municipalities, in a small country of 2.9 million. And then think about the political uh, effort of a prime minister to agree with all the parties, to agree with all the parliament, to actually change the administrative map of the uh, uh, local governments. Now we have 61 from 371, 61 municipalities, and it has saved time for people, money for the citizens, and it has improved the, uh, it has improved the services to the community. Here I have the deputy mayor of uh, the capital who is uh, together with their team as an example how the municipality can change and the country can change. Now, my last part is about the uh, weak state capacity. Reforms, everyone knows here, um, and it's, this is not new, they have their costs. And I'll share you one moment with our Prime Minister about the electric energy uh, reform. Before I tell you that, I could tell you that when we took office, Imagine, 48% were technical and non-technical losses. Do you know what non-technical losses means? Outright theft. 48%. Imagine that if they were spending or they were billing 100, practically half of it would never actually show up in the books, would be stolen, would be never paid. Can uh, corporate continue like that? No. Can a budget that would actually subsidize it go like that? That's not possible. So uh, before the local elections in 2015, the Prime Minister summons up us and um, me, the Minister of Infrastructure also, and we're discussing about should we continue with this very tough reform because it be became very tough. Practically, people were paying money for the first time, many people, but 74% in the polls were showing that they were supporting this because at the end of the day, they wanted security of supply, but also fairness in the market. And then the discussion was, should we slow this down now that we have the election? Should we actually give it a break? And at the end of the meeting, we all agreed that Let's see how people have really perceived us as reformers. And definitely we had a great success which confirmed that the reforms should be perpetuum. Now, I am developing, uh, not yet scientifically, a theory about us Albanians. Uh, and I call it the, uh, let's say, the hangover syndrome. And in the future, I'll work more to kind of detail it. Probably, Ricardo, th this could be uh, another project together to kind of detail the hangover uh, syndrome, not simply for one country. 
what is the hangover uh, syndrome? We Albanians celebrate in time of difficulties and crisis. We do. I know time is out, very, but, but two minutes more. Time is out even before I started because it's five o'clock. So uh, we actually celebrate in, in difficult times or crisis because we know that in many occasions of crisis, uh, our survival and responsibility part of the DNA wakes up. And then we make the crisis turn around into success. And then in time of success, we celebrate a rather long, which gives us a heavy political and institutional hangover, which prepares us and impedes us for the crisis to come. We self-prepare the next crisis by long celebration on success with a hangover effect. So, so practically, I will close here by saying that small countries like, like us, we're small countries, small economy, open. We don't have the luxury to stop and celebrate because we have a challenge every day. And here, I would say that uh, we have made the country turn around. It, was, it has been strong leadership, not yet a systemic capacity strong, but more than it used to be. Because as Matt actually reminded me today, back three years or four years ago in one of the courses here in Harvard that I participated, he asked me, we need some people. We need 30 people to have a project in Albania. And I said, it would be very difficult to find five. And then Matt and his team came to Albania Five or seven were rare. Now, there are 200 met. So practically, the system is not yet there, but it is being built. Thank you very much. Thank you.